Um, my name is Bridget McCormick. I'm manager of school programs at the Hudson River Museum, and I'm joined by my colleague, Bidi Garcia Choi, um, who is the manager of youth and family programs at the museum. So hopefully um, some more of you will join throughout this program. Um, oh, we have one more person. Um, I'll just reiterate that for a second. Hello, welcome. Um, and what we're doing today is we are actually going to be focusing on one artist that we currently have on view in an exhibition at the Hudson River Museum called Landscape Art and Virtual Travel. And this is an exhibition that we are putting on view in partnership with our colleagues at Art, the Art Bridges Foundation. Um, they have been working with us the past few years and loaning us um, some fantastic works of art from their collection in order to enhance the stories we're telling with our own permanent collection. Um, so this program should be fairly short in duration, maybe about a half hour or so, and um, we will be going through a slideshow and then trying out a little activity together. Um, so again, you can use the chat function or you can unmute yourself if you wanna actually respond in real time to the questions that we're asking today. Um, Beatty, thank, thank you for being here to help me out. Um, so we're actually gonna get started. First of all, we're gonna do, um, we're gonna do a little poll and I'm gonna launch the poll now. It's a Zoom poll if you're able. Um, BD, you can actually participate in this, but it's gonna ask some questions to get us kind of focused on the topics that we're describing today um, in the program. So, feel free to answer the questions that are on the screen. The first question is, have you ever moved from one location to another? The second question is, do you have a place in the world that is significant or special to you? The third question is, do you have any objects that are connected to a place that is special to you? And the fourth question is, have you ever felt the emotional state of homesickness? So these are kind of big questions, but um, perhaps you can take a few minutes to think about these. You don't have to answer the poll questions. It's totally optional, but at least think about them. As you can see, we're gonna be talking about places, journeys, um, feeling connected to certain places, what that means, the idea of feeling homesick or missing places that you might be connected to. So I'm gonna end the poll in about 10 seconds. Just so you can think about it a little bit further. And I know that I can answer personally, yes, I've moved from one location to another. Yes, I have places in the world that are significant or special to, my, to me. I have objects that are connected to that place. And I have felt the emotional state of homesickness, even though I'm not young anymore and that I've had a lot of different homes, I'm homesick for different places that I've lived or experienced things in. So, Let's get started. Um, we just did this first poll about where we're coming from and I wanted to show you the Hudson River Museum's exterior. We're located in Yonkers, New York. So if you're joining us from a location other than Yonkers, um, we are glad to have you. If not, we hope um, that you are able to come visit us sometime soon if you're in the area. The museum um, is located right along the Hudson River, which you can see here. So obviously that's where we derive our name, but we have um, different exhibits that connect to the river as well as to landscape art, figural art, um, all sorts of topics that we explore using our collection as well as borrowing from places like Art Bridges. And um, we also, you can see in the back, have our Glenview Mansion. Um, but what I'd like to say is that we are open to the public. So um, if you check our website, hrm.org, you can learn all about how to visit. If not, you can always join us in one of our virtual programs like today's. So, I had some further questions just to think about, and maybe BD, you want to answer some of these with me. Um, and this will get us into the mindset of talking about the artist that we're focusing on today. We'll learn about her in just a moment. But the first question I have is, um, where is your favorite place in the world? BD, do you want to tell me? That is a super cheesy question to answer. 
My favorite place in the world is in Mexico and is my hometown, Oaxaca. My hometown is beautiful, sunny, and I miss it all the time. Because where do you live now, Bidi? I am living right now in Junkers, mm -hmm. uh, very close to the museum because I work there. So I find a place super uh, close to just walk in. Right. So it seems to me that you've already kind of answered a couple of these questions, why the place is special or significant. It's where you're from. It's your hometown, your home country. Um, it's beautiful. It's sunny. There's probably not long winters like we just had here in Yonkers. Um, that explains one of the questions that I had down here. What does it feel like physically? What's the climate? What's the landscape like where you're from? So I, it's very dry. Differently mm -hmm. from New York, that it, you can find water everywhere with rivers, lakes, creeks, etc. In from Mexico, it's very dry. It's very dusty, but it's like um, a different like uh, flora. You can find agave. You can find cactus. You can find like different kind of like plants. Mm -hmm. And um, I miss uh, the, that part of my house because we have a big garden, and in this, this garden we have like a mango tree. Uh, uh, like a lemon tree, a guava tree. In my garden is very small, but we have a very different kinds of like um, fruits and veggies that we can grow all year around. So that's why I, I miss it so much. Sounds like a totally different climate than here. Um, and it sounds distinct in that it sounds more like a desert, very dry. Mm -hmm. uh, the characteristics are probably very different in terms of even walking on the ground and what it feels like and what you see. Um, when I was thinking about these questions, I can share with you that my favorite place in the world is Vermont, the state of Vermont, and that's where I grew up. It's my home state. It's where I feel like most connected to, similar to what you were saying. Um, and I think um, when I think about what it feels like, it feels like, uh, depending on the season, it could be warm, but often I think about be it being kind of crispy and cold. Mm -hmm. um, and the climate, you know, is generally pretty chilly. Um, the winters are longer there. There's usually quite a bit of snow. Um, right now, I think it's that time of year that's called mud season, where it's, you know, about to be transitioning to warmer weather. So snow is starting to melt and the ground is starting to thaw. It had been frozen and uh, mud season is what you call it because you walk outside and basically you're always walking in mud puddles. You're starting to sink into it. Mm -hmm. um, and when I think about this last question, which is another one that maybe you want to answer, do you have any physical specimens or objects from this place? I was talking to B2B before this program started, and I was, um, I don't know if you can see my rock that I'm holding up, but um, I have all sorts of specimens from Vermont, and I feel like I gather them when I'm out on hikes or walks or something, and it's, um, this rock is from a river where I was swimming one summer. It's totally smooth and really kind of fits right into my hand. Um, it's like a giant egg or even a potato, like Beauty said, but um, it feels really comforting to hold. And I think about the idea of connecting to the landscape of my home this way. I'm like, have a little bit of it in my hand right now, um, which is something interesting to think about. Do you have something like that maybe here in Yonkers, Beauty, that's from, um, you know, from Oaxaca that you have brought with you? Or do you have an example of something like that? Yes, actually, yes. It's not like uh, coming from nature, but usually when I travel home, I always bring like some textiles or like ornaments. And this is one thing that I brought this time. It's like a, a diadem with like ribbon. And I am always bringing something that is colorful because I, I, I feel that like bright colors like remind me my, my home place. Beautiful. So these are some ideas we'll continue to think about as we learn about our featured artist today. So I wanted to show you a portrait of her first. Her name is Anna Mendieta. Um, and right now we have on loan from Art Bridges uh, a short video that she made in 1981. We'll talk about that in a moment. But um, Anna Mendieta did a lot of artwork that had to do with where she was from, how she felt connected to that place, um, how it felt physically or how it feels physically, what it looks like physically. Um, and also in those artworks that she made, she thinks a lot about emotions. And um, some of those emotions might be heavy and sad, but they're ones that I think a lot of people have experienced before. So this is a portrait of Anna. She was born actually in Cuba. So I have a map here to show you. 
Cuba is the island just south of Florida here. Um, and it's in this reddish color. So um, Cuba is a country that has a complicated and, and um, convoluted political history. I'm not gonna get into the details of that so much today, but um, Anna was born here. And one thing to know about her is that she actually at the age of 12 um, was forced to leave Cuba because of political reasons. And she and her siblings ended up in Iowa, the state of Iowa, which is here in the middle of the United States in the Midwest. She was 12 years old, like I said, and she had to leave um, some members of her family behind. It wasn't a journey that she took by choice. There were a lot of things happening in the country of Cuba that um, complicated family relationships and complicated where people could be safely. So long story short, she was part of a program that brought kids out of Cuba into the United States. So she ended up growing up the rest of her um, childhood, you know, in teenage years in Iowa. She went to art school. She studied art in Iowa. She studied sculpture. She studied film. She studied more traditional art like painting. And eventually she ended up in New York City as an adult where she lived the majority of her adult life and where she made most of her artworks or where she started to develop most of the ideas for artworks that she might make in other places. But one of the things to know about her is because of this event that happened when she was a child about having to leave her homeland of Cuba, um, that was a really significant event that affected everything that she did in terms of her art and what she was trying to say and what she was trying to process by making that art. So hopefully that makes sense in a, a very, it's a very simple explanation for her. She was much more complicated than that, but I think for our purposes today, learning about her, that's a good story to know. So she took a journey and some of that journey was a choice and some of it was not. And I wanna show you here, um, this is what is called a film still. Um, Anna Mendieta worked in lots of different media. We call it multimedia when an artist makes artworks that's in lots of different forms. And one of the forms she liked to make artwork in was in video. So this is a still meaning it's just one frame from a film that she made in 1981. And it's called Esculturas Rupestres, which is um, a translation for that is Rupestrian, Rupestrian Sculptures. Um, Rupestrian is a word that you don't hear very much, but what it means is artwork that's made on the walls of, um, you know, rock or caves. Um, you could think about it as being uh, a mark that's made on uh, natural material like rock. Um, and I just want to see, Beatty, maybe you want to answer me, um, but what do you notice about this landscape? It's in black and white, but what do you notice about it? Any observations? I believe you are muted. Sorry. Remind me my hometown because oh. it's like different and dry. <laughs> <laughs> it has a mount mountain in um, probably old grass. Mm -hmm. And you were saying it's dry because right here it looks like it almost seems like a sandy spot or a dirt spot. Yeah. And what's interesting about this film is it was made in Cuba. So it's interesting. Actually, let's go back for a second. We can maybe even see, you know, um, I'm not exactly sure where Oaxaca is located in Mexico. It's kind of north, isn't it? It's in the south side and it's close to Guatemala. Oh, so it's down here. Yes. Okay. It's exactly so right there. Yeah, so it's interesting, actually, if you look where Cuba is, if we think about latitude and longitude and then how that might affect climate, it would make sense that maybe um, this still of the landscape in Cuba might look more similar to Oaxaca than the Yonkers for sure. So yeah, it looks kind of dry. To me, it looks rural. There's not a lot of, you know, there's no buildings here. This is not in a town or a village even. Um, she's really out in nature um, when she was filming this. I wanna show you some more stills from this video. What do you mm -hmm. notice here? Wow. I feel that this is like a, an sculptor mm -hmm. with a stone, uh, with a woman's body. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think right away you look at the center here of this still and you see this figure um, and it appears to be made out of stone. When I'm looking even closer, this looks like it might be kind of muddy or even dusty ground. Um, and clearly Anna Mendieta has made a sculpture 
that resembles the figure of a woman. You know, it has the kind of body shape of a, a female. Um, it's not totally defined. So when I look at it, I kind of think about how it looks almost sort of ancient or it looks sort of primitive in terms of artwork. And primitive artwork you can think about in different contexts, but um, it's not like we're looking at a photorealistic painting of a figure. You know, it's just the basic shapes and the basic kind of lines that indicate that perhaps this is a female figure. And it's kind of leaning here in the landscape on um, some other rocks and you can see some of the other foliage behind it. So it's really interesting. What do you think she might've made it out of? You said rock, any other ideas? Mm, maybe sand. Maybe sand. Mm -hmm. Do you think she used the kinds of materials that you might usually locate in an artist's studio or in a workshop? Kind of a hard probably. question. Yes, probably, but I probably just she just just like drawing a, in a stone that already exists. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, Bidi, if you've ever been, um, for example, to swim in a lake or a pond or even the the ocean. Um, I was thinking about how when I have been at the ocean before, a lot of times I notice people making things out of sand, mm -hmm. maybe a sand castle or some other figure. Um, this kind of reminds me of that a little bit. It's like using the material that's right around you to make artwork. And that material is natural. It's not necessarily man-made. I want to show you some more stills from the film, from Rupestrian Sculptures film. Um, and what do you notice about these? Does anyone, do any of them catch your eye or do any of them make you think? Or are you wondering any questions about any of these images? I can tell you something. When I was looking at this one, this one up here on the upper left, when I first looked at it, I kept thinking about a horseshoe crab. I don't know if any of you have ever seen any of those at the ocean before, but to me, it looks like, um, it looks like some kind of very, um, and horseshoe crabs have been around for millions of years. So I kept thinking about how this looks like an ancient kind of animal or um, almost like if you think about looking in a microscope it reminds me of like a bacteria or a germ that might be swimming around under a microscope lens. So to me, it seems to be this figure that was like, or something you might see very, very deep in the bottom of the ocean, like I've seen on shows about the ocean before. So it looked really like something from, from nature. Yeah. And Patricia in the chat said like a fossil. I totally agree. Yeah. So to me, it felt, I felt that same way. It felt like very prehistoric, very old. Um, and there's um, a word we'll learn a little bit later um, about that. And this bottom right hand corner one to me, it seems to be a lot like the first image we saw. It's resembling a human figure. You can see arms, a head, maybe the, the legs, more of a torso. Um, same with this bottom left hand one, you see these figures kind of carved into the ground, into the mud, the wall of a cave. So this is all work by Mendieta. And I want to tell you that one of the things that she did often um, was known as performance art, where you might think of performance art as being like dancing or um, even music could be considered a type of performing art. Um, but some artists really kind of pushed the definition of what that is. And she was one of the artists to do this. And performance art became more about doing things like making marks in the, in the, in the land or filming yourself making a work of art and then having that be a work of art itself. Um, it's an interesting extension to think about versus just painting on a canvas or making a sculpture, the performance becomes the artwork itself. The act of doing something becomes the artwork, it's the artwork itself. So I want you to think about that. I also have a question about these kinds of artworks and where they're made. So what do you think happens to an artwork like this over time? If it's lines that are carved into the ground or lines that are maybe made or shapes that are made on the walls of a cave or on a rock, what do you think might happen over time to a work like that? Just think about that for a second. 
And I want to tell you, I have a lot of words here. We're not going to talk about all of them, but you may have heard me say some of these um, during this presentation. So I want to make sure we just are kind of clear on what some of them mean. Um, Rupestrian, and that was the name of Ana Mendieta's film that we just saw, again, is a word that means artworks or marks or shapes um, that are made on the walls of a cave or on a rock um, by a human. And in other words, that might be called a petroglyph, and that's a word for an ancient kind of um, mark that might be made on caves or on other structures. Um, I wanted to talk about the idea of a symbol and about what that might mean. Um, because if we go back to Anna's works here, we can see that they're kind of figures, but they're not exactly realistic or, or um, the way that they look in real life. Like I can see Beauty's screen is on, I can see her face and she's a real human. This resembles a human, but it's not exactly what a human looks like. And a symbol is a way that an artist might make a mark that represents something, but it's not the actual image of a thing. So think about a symbol as a representation of something versus the actual thing. Uh, another example of a symbol that you might all know is like a logo for something. This is this is sort of obvious, but I was thinking about a logo like from McDonald's, the restaurant is like the M. You see the M and you know that that's a symbol for McDonald's. That's just a very simple example. Um, and I wanted to talk about this idea of the four elements of earth, water, air, and fire because Ana Mendieta made a lot of artwork that was based on manipulating those four elements. And those are known as classical elements. We don't have to get into the details around that, but there are materials that come from nature or that are natural. And so she often um, was using those materials in her artwork and they didn't necessarily always remain for alternity. So we talked about performance art a little bit. We talked about multimedia art. Um, down here, I have this word ephemeral. And ephemeral means something that doesn't last. It's, it's, um, it's something that transitions. It's something that's impermanent. Um, we were talking about sandcastles before. You could think about a sandcastle as being ephemeral because over time, the waves eventually wash away, right? So they, um, a sandcastle is an example of ephemeral art, you could say. Um, Anna Mendieta loved to use her body in artwork. Sometimes she would even use her whole body and imprint it into mud or cover herself with, cover herself with flowers, for example. Um, land art was uh, something that was growing and being evolving during the time she was practicing art. Um, and she was very connected to that movement. Same with body art. She used her body in art. Sometimes she used um, her body to make marks itself, like I said, on the mud. Sometimes she used it on paint to make mark on walls. Um, and feminist art means that she was obviously a female and she was really concerned with how females existed in the world and how they felt and how to share that kind of experience through artwork. So we'll talk about some of these words later. Um, line, shape, form, texture, pattern, contrast, and emphasis. Those are all words that have to do with principles and elements of art. So even when you go back and you look at, you know, this up here, which, you know, Patricia in the chat said looked like a fossil, um, there's a lot more going on than just kind of a random shape with some lines. Um, and any artist, Anna Mendieta included, thought carefully about these kinds of topics in creating the works that she was making. So I want to show you something here. Um, I was last time I was in the city, which was a while ago because we had a pandemic. So um, it's been a while, but I always notice something when I'm in uh, New York City or I've actually seen these all over the place. But I noticed that uh, a modern kind of mark making thing is um, you might see it even on the sides of buildings sometimes in an urban area. Um, but graffiti art, I think, is a very interesting connection because a lot of times you see people putting stickers up or they put, um, they shouldn't be doing it, but they'll paint on the side of a building um, and they're making a mark. They're leaving a tag. They're leaving their signature. 
And I was thinking about how Anna Mendieta did that in a way that was ephemeral. It didn't last, you know, water, you know, from waves or maybe rain or just over time, the marks that she made faded. But I think it's interesting that people have this urge to leave a mark somewhere. And the mark might be um, put in a place that they go to often or they think is important, but there's something about humans wanting to make a mark that I think is we, we should think about today. Um, thousands of years ago, I wanna show you some examples of petroglyphs or rupestrian artworks that were made in Namibia, which is in the continent of Africa. And you can see there are these animals, like a herd of, um, it looks like um, maybe cattle or um, wildebeest, or I'm not even quite sure, but animals that thousands of years ago, some human made a mark about these animals that perhaps he or she was noticing or that they were um, you know, trying to track in order to hunt. Um, but I think it's another example of how this idea of making a mark somewhere has been something that humans have wanted to do ever since there's been humans on this planet. Um, you can find lots of examples of these. I was looking up some earlier. There's very famous ones in France too, or we think that some of those marks on the walls of caves in France are some of the earliest artworks that have ever been made by humans. And then I wanna show you, I made this mark. Um, Bidi, you can, you can speak to this, but last month in February, we had so many blizzards here in Yonkers. We had so much snow, it was just crazy. So one day we, I was home, you know, cause it had been, a, there had been a blizzard. My car was covered in snow. Everyone was using their shovels and digging out. And then I started to think about the mark making. And I started to think about how, um, I wondered if, you know, making a mark in snow was similar in feeling to making a mark in mud or in sand or on the walls of a rock cave. And I made a mark with my first letter of my name, B, Bridget, and I made it in the snow. And it was really interesting because I watched this. I didn't take another photo, but my mark was in the snow for weeks until finally it got warm enough and rained where it melted and then it was gone. So it was interesting to sort of just experiment with this. And the feeling of making the mark was satisfying. I used the end of a big wooden spoon, you can see. And I wanted to tell you that um, when I was making my letter mark, I thought about two things. The first thing I thought was it meant something personal because it was a B for my name. And the second thing I was thinking was it reminded me um, of the hills that and the mountains that surround the area where I'm from in Vermont. So these two kind of like um, I don't even know what to call them, but these two bumps on the B um, reminded me of landscape, of a landscape that's not flat, of the place where I'm from. So I started to think further about marks and how they might connect to who I am and where, I am, where I'm from and what I value and the place I'm homesick for. And I wanted to also just show you something to experiment with, and I'm going to share it in the chat. Um, one second. Okay, so um, I have here what's known. I'm going to put it in the chat again. Leah did it earlier. But I have what here what's known as a jam board. And a jam board is a um, collaborative kind of. Um, I don't know, drawing space, I want to call it. Can you all see my Jamboard now? And I just put the link to the Jamboard in the chat, which means you can also access it if you want. And the way you use it is up here, you see some arrows and you can navigate on the arrows to a blank page. And over here, what I have is a pen, an eraser. Um, there is something where you can add images. I'll show you how to do that in a second. but. I would like you to experiment and maybe think about these mark makings that Anna Mendieta did based on um, the kind of experience she had in life where she was making these marks in the land of Cuba that she traveled to, back to after she had been in the United States as a child, after she grew up there, after she studied art and started to try to make connections between where she'd come from and where she ended up. So. Um, we think back to her fossil like marks on the land. She had traveled back to Cuba. She was making her mark on her homeland, even though she didn't live there anymore permanently. 
She was trying to connect with it. She was trying to maybe make up for lost time. There's all sorts of reasons she might've been doing it. I see BD is doing something really interesting here, making some marks, but I wanted to show you again, my B mark that I had done in the snow. I turned it on its side to look like mountains. I had put this image in of Vermont. This is what it looked like where I grew up. And it reminds me of those kind of swells of the hills and mountains. BD, do you want to tell us about your mark you're making? Yes, I am copying yourself. I mean, I am copying, like making your uh, another B, but this time with B like BD. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I just thought about something that I really love and is uh, water and the ocean. So that's why I, I just draw some waves. Oh yeah. And this actually, the lines and the shapes that you're making remind me of Ana Mendieta's work too. Um, they're kind of simple, but because they're simple and they're, um, they're, they're, they're symbols and motifs you see all over the place, they feel both new and current because you just made them and they feel ancient at the same time. I was thinking about something else, like um, if I was going to make another mark, uh, I don't know what kind of mark I would make. And sometimes what I suggest doing, if you want to try to figure out what your mark might be is, you know, just take a piece of paper and a pencil and see what happens when you have those two things and what kind of designs just come out of your, your hand without thinking about it too much. And sometimes the lines can be very, very simple, like BD is making. Um, sometimes they can be like waves. Sometimes they might be more like um, a letter, like mine. Um, but that might be an interesting way to experiment with this. And then what I would suggest trying out, just to see what it's like, um, is maybe later today or sometime this week, the snow has mostly melted in Yonkers. If you're joining from another area in the country or somebody, somewhere else, then you might have a different kind of situation, but see what it's like to make a mark in the ground. You know, Find a stick and make a mark in the mud or make a mark in the dust, or maybe even take one rock and make a mark on another rock. I've done that before too. Um, and just see what it feels like and see kind of the emotions that come up and see if, it's satisfying or see if it makes you connect more with where you are. I'm gonna stop the share because I wanna tell you about a couple other things. Um, you can use the Jamboard as long as you want, but um, I think that one thing to keep in mind is that no matter what, humans make journeys, they make trips, they, take, they make travels. Sometimes those travels are things that they um, engage in by choice. Sometimes there are travels that have to happen and it's not necessarily their choice. Um, and I think no matter what, everybody connects to certain places. And it's, it's, it's interesting to reflect on what places you connect to, what ones come to your mind and why, and to think about how you feel when you think about those places. And I wanted to share also that sometimes places bring you a lot of joy, sometimes places don't. And I think that that's something to be aware of and not to think is a bad thing. I think it's an interesting to reflect on it no matter what. And sometimes when you think through why you feel a, way, a certain way about a place, it can help you understand it further or maybe understand yourself further. So on that note, remember Ana Mendieta, I wanna um, put a link in the chat about a great little clip I found um, from the gallery in New York that often shows her work. Um, it's only about three and a half minutes long, but I'm putting it in the chat if you want to take a look at it um, on your own time, because you will be able to see some more of her works um, in person and the size of what they look like when they're in a gallery space versus on a screen. And you'll see the materials that, were, that she was using to make work and learn a little bit more about her motivations and why she was doing it. But I think that she's a fascinating person and she's a fascinating person because she made artwork that was very personal and very, an emotion, very emotional and very connected to where she was coming from physically on this planet. And she almost sometimes made herself part of the planet itself. And uh, on that note, um, 
please join us again for any other virtual programs. Uh, HRM.org, I'll put it in the chat. Um, calendar will list all of our upcoming programs. Um, we are doing things virtually for the most part, um, although we are slowly hoping that um, sooner than later things will be back in, to normal and people will be able to come to programs on site. So our programs are for the most part virtual, but the museum is open to the public um, with time tickets and uh, we hope that you can make it there sometime. Um, Anna Mendieta's film, Rupestian Sculptures, will be on view through August 8th at the museum. And we thank Art Bridges as well for lending us that work and helping us showcase our own landscape art and uh, landscape works in a different context and think about these ideas. Could you send the chat out in an email? I cannot see it on the screen. Yeah, you know what I think we will do is um, we have the list of emails of participants and maybe we can follow up by sending out these links to that. Okay. Thank you. Patricia, thanks for coming. I see your message in the chat. Um, you know, we hope you experiment with some mark making and think about even what your mark might be and what that symbol might represent. But otherwise, stay warm, enjoy the sun. It's finally sunny in Yonkers. Happy, happy uh, daylight savings day. I guess it's uh, Eastern time now. So we lost an hour of sleep, but now we'll have longer days and happy almost spring. Um, and we hope to see you sooner than later. So stay well. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Bridget. Thank you, BD, for helping. Take care. All right. I'm going to stop recording. I put them in the waiting room.